I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. For this episode, I'm speaking with Melissa Diaz, an artist and licensed, registered, and board-certified art therapist living and working in Brooklyn, New York. She holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Painting from the University of Central Florida and a Master's in Art Therapy and Creative Development from Pratt Institute. In 2010, Melissa Diaz founded Open House Brooklyn, a community arts initiative that provides free and affordable pop-up art events, exhibitions, and therapeutic arts workshops. As a creative arts therapist, Diaz has experience utilizing art therapy, play therapy, and mindfulness practices with adults, children, and families. She's worked as a therapist and teaching artist in shelters, schools, museums, inpatient and outpatient psychiatric settings. Diaz has presented widely on the topic of art therapy application at several institutions, including Pratt Institute, the School of Visual Arts, University of Central Florida, the University of Wisconsin, and Blick Art Materials. In her work, she creates interactive installation art as a source of community engagement. In 2015, she was awarded a residency at the Marble House Project where she explored the integration of installation, art, art therapy, and environment. She has exhibited widely throughout New York City and nationally in both gallery and alternative spaces. In all her work, Melissa Diaz considers space, relationships, and the holding environment. So I thought we could start by talking a little bit about uh, this benefit that you had yesterday. It was part two of a benefit that you've hosted, a silent art auction, uh, to raise funds for Puerto Rico. Yes. Um, So Puerto Rico is near and dear to my heart. Um, My grandparents were living there, and a lot of my family is there. Um, So I definitely started out just because I felt helpless. Like, I don't really know. I can't go there right now. Um, and I didn't really know what I could do. So, um, through Open House, my organization where I do pop-up art shows and workshops and such, I, um, put together a silent art auction. It was an open call. I accepted all the work that anyone donated, which sometimes is hit or miss, but it turned out to be a really amazing show. Um, and then... Yeah, and then I researched, I was looking for organizations that were considering the, like, mental health component of the trauma that's going to continue to unfold as they rebuild. Um, So the New York Foundling uh, runs Head Start programs in Puerto Rico, so, which is um, kind of like education, social work, um, you know, getting kids and their families in the right direction for their needs. Um, so the first benefit was, uh, we donated there and it was at Chinatown Soup Gallery. I wrote a grant for this super sweet gallery that's a co-op gallery, so they invite different groups in. Um, and we raised $2,000 the first time, a little over $2,000, um, artwork by so many different people. Um, a lot of art therapists were involved, which was really special because art therapists don't show their artwork as often um and then the second one took place with the leftover works from the first benefit show um and my friend cheryl walpole worked that um new york creative arts therapist art spa 
Um, and it is a group creative arts therapy organization. Um, and in their waiting room, they have a little gallery area. And that's the art song. Um, and I've shown there before. So she invited me to bring whatever works were left over. Um, and that opening was last night. And it was really sweet. We sold like four or five pieces so far. Um, but it is up until the end of May. So I'm thinking that some more donations will come in. And this one's going to um, Habitat for Humanity, Puerto Rico. Because um, while some areas are rebuilt and doing okay, like San Juan and other kind of tourist areas that have a little more money, um, the more mountainous and marginalized areas are still really going through it, and many other people. Um, so hopefully this money can go towards rebuilding efforts. Is there any way for people to see the pieces that are available online, or is it only in person? I haven't put them online yet, but if they're going to be online, either through the Open House website, um, or I might try to see what website I can put them on for auction. Um, so right now they're up, they'll be up for a month in um, 191 North 10th Street in Williamsburg by appointment. So that's something somebody wants to buy. Um, and then I'm hoping things would get the work up in the next, like, two weeks online. So, yeah, and there's all different sizes and paintings and prints and photographs and some really rad work from emerging artists and mid-career artists. So it's a nice way to, like, start or add to your art collection, too. I love when people offer this sort of thing, like art at 50 a $100, so that people can get art even if they don't have a lot of money for art collecting. Exactly. And then it's like a win-win, too, for the artist who's then they're getting to know your name, maybe building a relationship for the future. Um, so the auction last night was minimum of 150 and then um, having to go up from there. Um, but now all the work is going to be split with either at a $50 or $100 flat rate. So even more reason. And as you mentioned, you did this through Open House. Did you want to talk a little bit about Open House? Sure. Um, you know a lot about Open House because you've been such a good friend of Open House for so many years and showed at Open House, too. So Open House is an organization I started in 2010, which is a really long time ago now. That's insane. Oof. Okay. Um, and really based on um, the community that we were living in, um, where I was meet, meeting a lot of like-minded individuals and artists and creatives. Um, and I myself, at times, it's hard to get a show and find a show in New York. Um, so there was that aspect of it, kind of putting it together yourself. Um, so I'll explain what it is, and then I can give some backstory. Um, but basically, it started out as an series in different apartments and lofts and backyards, um, rooftop spaces. Um, it always included a music performance and um, there's been some poetry readings and video. So definitely a multidisciplinary art experience where everyone was welcome. Um, and the thought of it was that it was bringing community and also networking individuals for more showing opportunities and more opportunities to collaborate musically. Um, but also bringing art as an interactive um, experience in the home. So a place that people are comfortable and familiar and taking it out of like the cute white wall experience of the gallery space, um, which could sometimes uh, be not as warm and comforting or kind of show the hierarchy of the artist and the other, the visitor, the audience. So I wanted it to be more of like a humanistic art experience so that people could feel like they're a part of creating the piece that is open house for that night. Um, so yeah, I was doing like bi-monthly shows and then um, quarterly, and then I started to branch out into some classes uh, with my friend Christina Danello, who's a yoga teacher and dancer. And so then we broke into some kids art and movement classes. Um, I've done several art therapy workshops through Open House, and we just continue to pop up in different places. It started all in home spaces, but we've been at coffee shops, 
bars, creative arts therapy spaces, um, the gallery that we have the opportunity to use. So we've definitely branched out into different venues. Um, and I'm trying to keep adding more of the creative arts therapy component along with exhibiting. Um, so there should be one coming up in the summer. I'm going to do it in my backyard, which has always worked out really nice. Um, yeah, that's open house. Well, this idea of like inviting the audience in reminds me a lot of your artwork itself. Because whenever you, for those who aren't familiar with Melissa's art, whenever you create an installation, there's always this component of like you welcoming the audience to actually come into the installation or interact in, with it in some way. Yeah, and that really like expanded in a more interactive way when I went to school for art therapy. Then I, cause I was always considering my installation as being able to be kind of immersed in a unified environment, yet separate, but with the interactivity, I think it came more from me learning about my art therapist self and co-creating. So I was thinking of the viewer, the visitor, a little bit differently um, so that they can play and touch and be a part of the experience more so than just watching the experience. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about your trajectory of like, being creative when you were younger, being an artist, and developing into becoming a creative arts therapist? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, throughout life, I think art has always been my ally, the place that I would go to for any opportunity for self-expression. Um, and I actually had seen an art therapist as a child. Um, I was going through some tough times in adolescence, and I didn't even know she was an art therapist. I just thought it was someone that I was talking to and drawing with, um, and that it was a positive experience, and it wasn't until much later um, in high school when I found out that that was an art therapist that I'd seen a very long time ago. So I became really interested because I'd already embodied that. I was kind of a, a loner kid and I was always doing my own artsy thing and it always felt like a safe place to be and comforting and a way to express kind of internal things that maybe I wasn't letting out in other areas of my life. Um, yeah, and then in college for undergrad I went for my BFA in painting and what I got mostly involved with was similar to open house but community building and started with a group of people that I went to school with at UCF, started a um, collective called Thread. And then through that, similar to kind of my inspiration for Open House, we were showing in um, homes in downtown Orlando, um, pop-up spaces, bars, coffee shops, a U-Haul, we drove a U-Haul around for a day of art and made it like this gallery inside. Um, so a lot of that inspires my ideas around community and interactivity and art as a social impact. Um, and so I, throughout college, I always knew I wanted to go to school for art therapy. Um, I also had taken a very silly, like, what career should you have test in high school? And art therapy was one of the things that came up. Um, so it was definitely something that intrigued me because I knew of the personal healing benefits of art. Um, and so I originally went to the University of Tampa uh, and they had a certificate program in art therapy. I still might. Um, then I ended up just going to school. I left that program and went to UCF for fine art. And I'm so happy I did that because I think I needed to embody my art practice to be able to understand how I would want to move into art therapy. Um, and then I went to Pratt um, for grad school and it's a very experiential um, program, so it was definitely in tune with my needs. Um, and my work shifted a lot from when I started to kind of take on the identity of a therapist or an art therapist, um, in that in undergrad I was making a lot of work that was more literal about emotions, um, kind of hard on the sleeve, many, many self-portraits. Um, and then through school, I started to kind of keep abstracting 
um, so that the emotions and feelings were coming through um, going inside of a space. Um, yeah, and then my installation work grew from undergrad and then from grad school I um, didn't make too much work while in art therapy school and then as soon as I left I had so much I felt like kind of get out and work out through art um, and that's when a lot of the interactivity came into play um, where I was considering the viewer as a co-creator in the space and I was also really really inspired and continued to be by Winnicott mm -hmm. and that was all of the stuff I was obsessed with in grad school and it really changed my concept of space um, and I started to think of my installation as that transitional space um, and my work is really bright, really playful, made with lots of children's art materials. Really was because at the time I was working with kids every single day um, and using these really simple galactic materials and there was so much um, that could be transformed that way. And I was also seeing transformations in my clients by their use. So it made sense for me to kind of shift into less fine art with materials. Um, so I worked with mostly like hodgepodge and model magic and paint painters and things I find on the street and found objects. And a lot of it's the thought of kind of reframing the identity of an object. Um, and then also inviting the viewer to see commonplace things to kind of change the dialogue and hierarchy between an artist and viewer kind of really like when people see my work and they're like, oh, I can make that. Um, rather than that being, it's definitely not an insult. It's definitely what I'm hoping to inspire. That it's a viable option for creativity, for an outlet for self-soothing, self-care. Um, so that's where a lot of the interactivity came through to, to be able to kind of hands-on experience the work. So that's kind of how the work changed a little bit as my art therapy self kind of came through and it's still it's still changing a little bit and and definitely inspire my art inspires my art therapy work and vice versa that's one of the things i've been trying to do a lot with my art as well is to actually have when i give a talk to actually have the audience participate in creating yeah. the art in some way yeah. Because people, you can talk about it all day, but people can't really understand it unless they do it themselves, you know? Absolutely, yeah. When I gave a lecture at um, the University of Central Florida, I gave everybody a pipe cleaner so that um, they could, like, fidget if they need to fidget. They can listen to me how they need to listen to me. Um, and they could also kind of be experiencing a sensory experience, too. Um, and I think it then brings you in as a, as a co-creator in the whole process of that lecture, um, talk experience. So, yeah, and I, I loved being part of that at, your, at that talk. I went where we were able to cut in. Um, yeah, it feels good to interact in that way. Um, and I'm thinking art is growing more and more and more in that area. Yeah, and I think with the internet as well, it's kind of taken celebrities or artists off this sort of pedestal where it seems yeah. like they're this other person and that it's unattainable and that they're, like, so special and privileged compared to everyone else. I feel like the internet and celebrities, like, talking to people through Twitter and social media, they've become more like real people, and it, I feel like it's making this generation feel more like it's something that they can do. They can be artists. They can be actors. Humanizing. It's not the idolizing exactly separation so that that's an inspiring way to think of things which I didn't really put together um, when I think about the internet and social media um, that's a really positive aspect of it thank you for bringing that to light to me <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about too like all the different kinds of settings that you've worked in and oh, where yeah. where art therapy is and what kind of settings uh, it's a part of. That's a great question because there is some common, which actually is getting more and more dispelled as, as we grow the field and more awareness comes. But one of the common themes was like, oh, you work with kids. Like, um, so it's an interesting thing to be thinking that that's kind of the norm 
lens that if it's art material and you're doing something therapeutic, it has to be for children. It's really nice that we're getting some more awareness. Um, so I've worked with, almost, with many, many, many populations. Um, so I have, and it just goes to show that art therapy is in many places and expanding further. But I've, um, I've worked at a preschool as an art therapist for children with special needs. I was also at um, a domestic violence shelter working with families and children um, for a couple of years. I've worked in museum settings, which is a really cool integration of art therapy within kind of the art continuum, um, which is something I'm really passionate about, that there's such a delineated line between the fine art world and art therapy and, um, and arts and crafts and what have you. Um, so, yeah, so I did some work at the King's Museum, at the Children's Museum of Art. Um, I worked for the Epilepsy Foundation in New York and did started an open studio, which also has some exhibition components. Something I think that a lot of people don't realize is that um, a lot of times psychologists, art therapists, aren't actually part of the main program in schools. Like when I worked at the university, I was an outside consultant as well. Um, a lot of times they're hired as kind of like consultants or freelance way and they don't get benefits and things like that. Um, and it really is something that's so beneficial and should really be more integrated and valued. So that's my hope. Um, I also went to Douglas. So this last kind of the whole experience has really hit close to home and really got me thinking about the way mental health needs to be in the school. And I work with adults with mental illness now, um, an interesting conversation I had with um, some of them was how difficult it was to be in school and be in high school and middle school because their behavioral problems weren't recognized appropriately. Um, so they were like the troubled kids who were getting suspended and internal suspension, et cetera. Um, but it was really that they were grappling strongly with their mental health. It wasn't diagnosed yet. Um, so an interesting thing that came up is one of my clients said, I used to get suspended all the time, and then I would just spend two weeks doing whatever I wanted, not going to school. And he said, I really wish that they would have connected you with services for the times you weren't in school. Um, because the punishment wasn't working, right? You get banned from school for a little bit, the time off, but also what, you know, where is the acting out coming from? You know, what and how is this person going to stay connected to school and not just be banished and then show back, show back up at school and pretend to do well? So it's kind of a flaw. It's a, it's a system of negative reinforcement. Um, so it was such an interesting thing, and it's such a simple connection to make that, yes, if a child is exhibiting all these behavioral patterns and then it's just out of school for a week or two, what are we doing to assure that, A, if you're worried about it for the school, how are you going to assure that that student's going to come back and not just do the same disruptive or whatever behavioral things that they thought? Um, but B, um, you know, how would they expect any change to happen? Um, and, you know, and I'm sure, you know, and parents and family are involved in that. That's definitely an aspect of it, which I'm sure can be helpful, but, you know, without kind of investigating if this is a pattern, where is it coming from? I think we're doing a really disservice. An enlightening thing that I wouldn't have even thought of because I didn't embody that experience, and my clients have. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in getting that topic out there. I mean, you know, it's really being talked about now about where mental health awareness can begin in the school, even classes that are educating and normalizing um, mental illness, um, because it's just another illness that's a component to human beings. Um, so hopefully also destigmatizing if there's education. So I want to try to get involved a little bit in that way. Um, and I know that the Art Therapy, the Florida Art Therapy Association was so great. And as soon as the Douglas shooting happened, the week later, they had started an art therapy drop-in at the Coral Springs Museum. Um, and I was just so proud of all the Florida art therapists. Um, so hopefully the dialogue is getting out there about mental health in general and art therapy um, as well. 
Yeah, and for those listening that don't know, both Melissa and I are from Florida. Melissa actually went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and graduated from there. And one of the things that I thought was really good as well, that they did start these art therapy programs for the kids right after that they could drop in and start processing right away. And they also brought therapy dogs to the schools when, when all the kids went back to school the first week. So good. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I've been following it really closely because it is so close to home and um, and such a huge issue, obviously. But the, a lot of the students were saying these dogs, these programs should be part of all schools just anyway because being a teenager even without this is so hard as it is. Yeah. And only getting, I mean, really harder. It's a different time than when we were in high school and didn't have so many uh, um, media and society and, and these internet social connections kind of thrown in your face that cause a lot of emotional barriers as you're just trying to figure out how to be a human um, in the world. So, yeah, that should happen. Um, so we shall see. And I know that there's a reoccurring, they started an art therapy group now at the Carl Springs Museum of Art that you can join. Um, it really, really, really makes me no, that's great. And you went to the March for Our Lives? I did. And it was one of the most beautiful activism uh, marches that I've been a part of. And I've been a part of quite a few. Because um, there were so many families. There were so many children having their first little activist experience, um, which I thought was really beautiful. Uh, so let's see what's to come. Yeah, I was in Munich at the time. And... Um on that Saturday, and I happened to visit a professor the day before the march on that Friday who worked at the University of Munich, and um, one of the things that we were talking about, um, they have a big memorial at the school there because when Hitler was coming to power, uh, there were student activists there that were protesting the Nazis at the time and distributing pamphlets, and they got round up and actually beheaded. Um, yeah, which is really horrifying to think about, but they have like three memorials there for the students there at the university, and to be there kind of seeing what like uh, peaceful student activism was happening at that time, and then the March for Our Lives was the next day, and actually the university students at the University of Munich were making a, a huge uh, protest for that as well, so that was really nice to see that it was happening across the world. Hopefully things keep moving in the right direction. It's some scary time. Yeah, and I really feel like for our society to move forward, we need to be more psychol psychologically minded overall. Like there just needs to be a greater awareness of the unconscious and how these kinds of mechanisms work in the human mind for people to be able to move past it as a society, Absolutely. work through it. And really normalize that it doesn't have to be this specialized knowledge for only a particular sector of healers or sick people. Yeah, because everybody experiences different levels or, dif or when they have greater times of stress, they're going to have more symptoms. It's just the way the human organism works. <laughs> sure. Definitely everyone's grappling every day with their thoughts and their behaviors and every part of existence. So, yeah. I log up. And I think a part of my work, too, I definitely, in my artist statements and in the interactive um, activities I bring, really try to think about bringing in the mental health lens and naming it and talking about it. Um, I do one workshop. I make this series called Rad Rocks. Um, and they're just rocks made from various materials, like styrofoam and pebbles and glitter and um, pieces of fake plants and whatever. Um, but when I make them, I try to meditate on what type of energy I want them to have. So even though they're not an actual energy healing crystal, also that they could imbue the energy from that moment or what I was hoping to put into them, to kind of um, think of them more as a transitional object, so something that has this specialness um, to self and beyond on the material. Um, and so I've done that as a workshop a couple times. Um, encouraging people to meditate a little bit before they get started and really think about what energy they need at that time. Um, so I'm really trying to also 
be bringing up some mental health awareness into my fine art work. Yeah, really focus their intentions of what they're creating, what they want to create. I did a little New Year's um, intention setting Rad Rock workshop, and it was, it was very sweet. No, I think that it's beautiful as well. Like you said, you work a lot with like found materials, the pipe cleaners, things that people might see as art, arts and crafts a lot of the time, and you turn it into these fine artworks and these fine art installations. So showing that it can work both ways. And that's ideally kind of paralleling my experiences in art therapy too, with kind of the discarded individual, individuals, the marginalized people, the stigmatized people that actually just have so much value, but society has kind of dictated what their value um, is. No, that's a great point as well. Like the idea that if somebody is mentally ill or has psychosis or some sort of sickness, uh, that might not make them, you know, fit into this cookie cutter mold of how people are quote unquote supposed to be, that their ideas and their art or what they have to contribute doesn't mean as much as if that has any validity. It's an interesting thing too because right now outsider art is really popular and then um, whole spaces that are kind of toggling the line of bringing in art therapy, but it's not really called art therapy. It's definitely art as therapy. So there's a gallery here in Brooklyn called Land, um, where artists with different intellectual um, disabilities just go and make their art. And they show it at the gallery, they show it at the outsider fair, they're getting really big and having solo shows and internationally. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's different interesting places that are kind of also within the realm of the therapeutic art, um, which, I, which is really, important to me that I think art therapy also exists within the art world in some way. Um, yeah, so that's a really nice aspect of things. Um, and Scott's gallery, Shrine, where he shows a lot of outsider art, but also did that make documentary. You get to actually hear from the artist and why they made this work and um, how it's a part of their lives. So. I think that's an important part of the story, too. And a great way to kind of shed light to the stigma of individuals who are different. Um, and lately I've been thinking about it, too. There's so much with the president and everything that's happening now. Trauma is going to become the norm. Mental illness will not be the unnorm. It will be the norm. You better stop marginalizing and stigmatizing now because going to be everybody. <laughs> kind of a sad way to think of things, but in reality, I mean, trauma's increasing. Um, we need to be talking about how we're working with our minds and our insides. No, absolutely, and I think the way that the news is presented and how it's like 24 hours and we're constantly getting these updates about all these crises and there's something happening every day that's huge, um, you know, bombing, tweets, all sorts of things. So it's like this constant panic that everyone's living in, and it's going to have effects now and probably for a while. Fight or flight, um, especially, like, you know, kids growing up now, too, is really different. So I don't know. Part of me thinks it could be interesting, though, when um, mental illness or mental health symptoms just become the norm. It's just realized as a part of existence, it's just one piece of an individual. Right, because everybody does process stress in a certain way. Everybody experiences stress, and some may have more overt symptoms than others, but some people might end up with IBS or like bowel mm -hmm. symptoms. Some people have panic attacks. Some people get migraines, um, but they're all related to stress and, and mental health. I can't wait till mental health and seeing a therapist is like looked at just like going to the gym. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you work out your body, you have to work out your mind too. Right? I know, it's so interesting too with um, like the way you just mentioned the somatic symptoms that come. Like those are so understandably treatable. Like, okay, my stomach hurts, I have to go to the doctor, I'm going to get medication, I'm going to do. Um, but it's so different not thinking of the brain as an equal organ. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we haven't mentioned? I have written down 
also your shows and your conference. So, oh yeah. Um, so yes, I am. Um, I'm in a show right now at the College of New Rochelle um, that also has an art therapy program, and they did a juried show with the theme of hope. Um, I'm in that show right now. The opening is the 21st. Um, and what's nice, and I think also adding to the art therapy field, is um, some of our requirements for continuing education have changed. Um, New York now requires continued ed credit for your license. Um, and we always have for our nationwide certification, the ATRBC. Excuse me. Um, but a valid way to get, like, at least 10 credits is to be a part of a juried show, which I think is really, really, really important that art therapists are practicing their, in their own body of work and creating. Um, and I think showing is important, too. That's kind of my own personal practice. Um, so the fact that you can get continued as for being a part of a juried show, I think, is super, super important because it's great to you know, go to workshops and do a lot of um, therapeutic experientials and at the same time, you kind of need to remember your own therapeutic experientials. The jury just give you an opportunity to kind of get a win-win with the CD being a show. So that's next weekend. Um, and then, what else? And then I'm a part of a lecture and I'm gonna be giving a talk with um, the Water and Stone, uh, it's a great, Creative Arts Therapy Organization here in New York. They're having their second conference. June 1st, we start. Thank you. I'm taking Saturday, June 2nd, and I'm giving a talk on um, incorporating art exhibitions into your therapeutic practice, primarily geared towards working with adults with mental illness or intellectual disabilities, um, because that's where I've done my research and where I've worked in doing that type of work. Um, so the talk will talk about outsider art, um, art education in the art therapy practice as a opportunity for um, kind of highlighting uh, and encouraging the destigmatization of artists with mental illness. Um, so I run a lot of groups where I actually you learn about artists who have a mental illness or struggle with their mental health, how they use their art express it um, and how they've been seen too and, and kind of gotten shows and been in museums and what that did. So yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about outsider art and um, disability education in that regard and I'll be talking about the connection of creating art um, in the studio space or the therapeutic space as somewhat like symbiosis and then moving the art object into the gallery space as kind of separation, individuation. So it's kind of a um, object relations based theme of the art object and the holding environment of the studio and then the gallery space. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about all that good stuff and then also just the nitty gritty kind of tips for how to put together a show if you're a therapist who's interested in um, putting together group exhibition for your clients. So, all my stuff, though, so I'm hoping to speak more on that theme and expand upon it. And also get more information from the people that I'm working with, too. I, I started a group um, that was a group about putting an art show together and what skills and things you need to accomplish in order to have a successful show, and then what anxieties that brings up in you, followed by, like, how that's the boundary and what coping skills you're going to use to um, work with that as you move forward and putting together the show. So a very behavioral <laughs> approach to um, creating an art exhibition. Uh, but I think that's important as well. I think a lot of therapists kind of stick to one uh, lens when they're working or one lens and looking at patients. Yeah. And it's really useful to use behavioral techniques sometimes if you're having a panic yeah. attack, relaxation works. I'm definitely a question because that's how it is because you're seeing the person and they have all different needs. So. Yeah, the needs may change over time. I think it's a skill to be able to be flexible. Well, that's exactly what I'm hoping to impart in my clients. So a part of it is kind of having to body that myself.
Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard artist and art therapist Melissa Diaz. For more about Melissa Diaz, visit her website, melissadiazart.com. I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. For more about me or Rendering Unconscious, visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net or renderingunconscious.org. Open there and cut. Sitting man, our England is our separate. Therefore, for the living repentance, as a thank you, as a voice, our bones, the passion with together a wide, to reduce to you, a law, the and you shall, each I shall, this, correctly established, the Shakespearean, be extreme, her outer dot we are, is but the tag, appropriate for shedding, the production and the ball, that allows and it entails a culture series. In fact, the teacher will their power the implicit possibility of tranquil of the creation of the art. To observation, as most of it historical, we are all welcome to the discovery that a wide psychology to reduce them to some essential. He wears the shadow and one is a violation of syntax Shakespeare with over time. Our characteristic of life, of life understood of life. and later an extension, we would understood as a and a biography when it's at war, only to recall now. England is healer separate who can lie their career for the living organism. Perhaps, perhaps, or organic sacred in New York City later due to not to be more. Us and the biography of which my of my only to recall has. does all the a worthy healer the final scene is who can like over pasture where feel dreams we are outer data appropriate for the tally and the water production that allows for the and if entails the culture in fact. The teacher was therefore that is the implicit possibility, tranquil, a jig of the creation of our death self. And when is your violation of syntax? We will, over time, our characterization of life and an idealization understood as gender to children when it's at war on the number. In early reason and tradition, a signifier back of the ability to show ritual, people create being products, swore hair just long enough to create people. But home is the four rivers, tradition, background, can in fact be really being products, swore laser, perhaps self, or organic artists we in New York City. Due to the motivation not to be not more as an ailment, as a disenrichment, idealization, does all the ratio or confine itself in only over pasture where full breast go into the problem. But home is the four rivers, solid, conscious, unconscious, fast be only by hippolyte, by quite definite. Cultural conscious, unconscious, she places the only by certain. Is it a boy, or white, definite, or a cultural structure? And places the where certain leaves decide. Is it a boy, or to observation of most of it, and and historical? We are all in well society to the discovery that psychology attention with some essential. He wears the venue a lot. Gender to children, to children, on the number, 
not early like us, a signifier of the ability to shore or keep and create self as only inherent, just long enough to create systems, go into the problem and cut, sitting in.